right, we're beginning a new series this morning from the, the epistle of 1 John. Um, that was one of the suggestions we had when we, when we asked, uh, you know, what, what uh, scripture, what uh, books of the Bible would you like to study? 1 John was out there a few times, and so it's a nice short book. It won't take two years to go through, two and a half, almost three years to go through. It's just going to take about three months to get us through 1 John, so that will be, uh, so it's not Acts, all right? It's not the book of Acts. A question before we start, because this, it, this sermon was, is entitled, I Was There. It would probably have been better titled, We Were There, because John writes in the first person plural in these first few verses. The, the name of the, of the series, the whole, the whole thing through 1 John, is Christian Credentials. Christian Credentials. We named it that because 1 John, perhaps more than any other, book in the New Testament tells us, here's how you know that you're genuine. Here's how you know if you're authentic, if you are a true believer, or if, if you're a pretender, uh, more than any other book. And, and, and John does it so simply, and in language so direct, it almost seems abrupt at times. It's, it's, he, he doesn't mince words like we very often do in the 21st century. So that's, that's what we're going to be looking at in 1 John. So I want you to think as we go through it this morning and every week, what is the evidence that I'm a believer? What, is there any evidence? If I were on trial, <laughs> could somebody look at my life and say, yeah, there's plenty of evidence this person is a Christian, or would it be kind of hidden? They'd have to search it out. So that's, that's what we want to look at today. We're starting at verse 1, chapter 1. I'm going to read right, just get started right away, and then we'll, we'll talk about some in introductory matters. So here we go. John, 1 John, chapter 1, not, not the gospel of John, 1 John, the epistle, chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Let's pray. Our Father, we look at this uh, first section of the book of 1 John, and it, it lays a whole universe out before us, almost. Uh, it's an amazing opening. Give us insight from your Holy Spirit to not only understand what John is writing with our minds, but Lord, help us to internalize the reality that life comes from you. You rescued us through the sacrifice of Jesus, who is God incarnate, who came to earth, who did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And he had to be who he was in order to do it. So Lord, help us to grasp that stuff, those, these, these great truths from your word. And we pray this in your name. Amen. A few things to introduce where we're headed here. First of all, whenever you have a book of the Bible, you want to know certain things about it. These things didn't just appear in thin air for the heck of it one day. They have a history. There is, a, there is a context in which every single book of the Bible was written, and 1 John is no exception. Now, it's a letter, but it's a weird letter as far as how it opens up, because mostly letters uh, at, at that period of time, they would always introduce the person who wrote it. So when Paul writes to the Christians at Corinth, or when he writes to the Christians at Thessalonica, or, or to, to some of the other places he wrote to, he starts off with saying, Paul. So you know right away who wrote it. Paul. I'm an apostle sent by God to do this, and Silas, who's with me, or Timothy, and he, he includes those who, who, who are, in a sense, writing the letter with him. We don't have any of that here in 1 John. There's no greeting, not so much as a hi, how you doing? He starts right off with theology, and he doesn't identify himself. So how do we know John wrote it? How do we know this is authentic? How do we know that, that John... Well, we know that John, the son of Zebedee, who had a brother named James, who also wrote the Gospel of John, 
wrote this. First of all, in the Gospel of John, he doesn't name himself there either. It's, it's, it's kind of an amazing fact, but we know. Now, how do we know? Well, okay, boring stuff first, then we'll get into more exciting stuff. We know from the history of the church, from the second century Christian writers who wrote about such things, who were much closer to the events that we, than we are, they said John wrote this. We, so we have people who were directly involved. There's a guy named Polycarp who was a disciple of John, who makes the point in the second century that John wrote this. We have internal evidence within 1 John itself. There was a striking resemblance between these three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Gospel of John, not only in style, but in subject matter and theme. Some of, the, some of it's almost word for word what he wrote in the Gospel of John. And we also have the author here in the first few verses claiming to be an eyewitness of Jesus. In other words, he's saying, I was there. Actually, he says, we were there. He, he's not alone in this. So we have those evidences that point to John, the disciple of Jesus, later the apostle, the same guy that wrote the Gospel of John, and also the same guy that wrote Revelation, wrote this. All right, that's the evidence. It was written to churches across the coast of Asia, places where Paul had been, and formed churches. So I got a little map for you here just because I do those kind of things, so if you can show that. So this, today it's Turkey, right? Country of Turkey. There, and then it was called Asia Minor. So John is writing, and by, well, if I get in front of that, we'll get feedback like crazy. So go to the west coast, and you see places like Pergamum, and Smyrna, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Ephesus, and Laodicea, and Colossae, and Perry. So all of that stuff there on the west coast moving towards the south, this letter, these letters were written, in a sense, to all of those churches. So it would go to one church. They would copy it. And they would send it on to another church who would copy it and send it on to another church who would copy it. They would read it in their settings. And 1 John being a, a short book was easy to read in one setting. One, it was a letter. These were real people that John was writing to. He was probably in Ephesus when he wrote this. Again, what do we know? We know a lot about Ephesus from Acts, right? You guys all know a lot about Ephesus from Acts. It was a major city there. It's where, it's where Paul spent three years. So there was a, a, a very stable church there at Ephesus, and word got around through the surrounding region. And so that's more than likely who this letter was written to. The letter deals with what Christians believe and how Christians act. What do we believe and how we act? And we need to understand that what we believe, what we believe drives how we act, or at least it should. Our theology, what we, what we know to be true about God, what we know to be true about Jesus, then drives what kind of people we are, how we act in this world towards one another and towards those who are not in the church. What, what, what are the actions of our lives based on? Well, it's based on what we believe. If it's not based on what we believe, then what is it based on? And if we're not acting out what we believe, then there's a sense of being disconnected from ourselves that... I'm sure none of you know about, right? <laughs> because you're always fully connected with, with your beliefs. So that, but John is going to write on those subjects. Some of the themes that he writes about is the theme of light. Light. He writes about life. He writes about hope. Truth. Love. Writes a lot about that. And I'm sure that, in fact, a good way to introduce this for yourself would be to go to the Gospel of John and read chapters 13 through 17. Chapters 13 through 17 of the Gospel of John all take place in the upper room the night before Jesus was crucified. Jesus gave a, an address to his disciples during that time. I mean, they, they had, the, they had the, the Passover, which we now call communion, but he addressed various themes, knowing that the next day he was going to die. So everything he says in chapters 13 through 17 of John, he is saying, knowing... It's the last time before I die that I'm going to get to talk to these guys. And so what I say is really crucial, really, really important. If you had time to spend with Jesus and he knew the next day he was either going to go away or die, imagine yourself in that setting in John 13 through 17. He talks, he talks about the future. He talks about mansions in his father's home and, and that if that weren't so, he would not have told his disciples he's going away so they can prepare a place for them. He talks about 
new commandments, like a, a new commandment I give you to love one another as I have loved you. He talks about the Holy Spirit quite a bit, that he's going to be sending them one like himself, a comforter, a, 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 an encourager, a paraclete is the, the Greek word. And, and he covers many of the same themes. Life, he prays a beautiful prayer. In John chapter 17, it's a prayer, we call it the high priestly prayer of Christ. In it, he is praying not just for his disciples, but there's, he talks about unity. He talks about the fact that when, when those who believe in him are unified, that the world knows that he has been sent. So the best apologetic we have as believers to the outside the world who do not accept Jesus as Savior is how we treat one another in the body of Christ, how we are unified with one another. If we can't pull that off by the power of the Holy Spirit, why should anyone want to be in it? And, and so Jesus covers those themes in his high priestly prayer, and John was there, and he heard all of that, and he talks about some of the same things here. Primarily, we look at how does a person know how do you know, how do I know that I have eternal life, that you have eternal life? And there are three things that John kind of, he, he goes, it, it, it's almost like um, it's circular. He covers one, and then he covers another, then he covers, and then he circles back and does it again. So it, it's a difficult letter. Charles and I spent a, quite a bit of time, how do you outline this thing? Because of he, he's, he's going through these themes one after another and then circling back. So he circles through a lot of themes. How do you know that you're genuine? How do you know you're a believer? Well, in, in 1 John, there are basically three tests that John is going to throw out there to say, here's how you know. Here's how you know. The first one is a theological test. I know you guys all love the word the What does theological mean, by the way, class? What is theology? The study of God. You can't. <laughs> Teacher's pet. I'm a seminary student, I guess. <laughs> I'm glad you say it because nobody else is. Okay, theology is the study of God, right? Just the study of God. And so when we say theological, we're saying that, that this has to do with God and, a, and an understanding of it. Not all theology is correct. There's a lot of aberrant theology out there saying that God is like a timeshare, or whatever else it might be. You know, there's some really weird ideas about what God is like. I did a sermon uh, series quite a while ago called Jesus in His Own Words, and, and, and I, I went through the Gospel of John to do that because everybody else wants to speak for Jesus and say, well, here's what He's like, or here's what He's like, and hardly anyone is actually paying attention to what He actually said, I am like. And so He has quite a few I am statements in the book of John. So, the first way you know, in a sense, if we're listening to John, that I am a, a, a genuine believer is a theological test, and that has to do whether one believes, now listen to this, because this is crucial, whether one believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who actually came to earth in a real body. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going around in John's day and in our day that basically doesn't, they don't want to believe that about Jesus. Who is he? And John makes it very clear. Those who know the truth believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came to earth in the flesh, that it was real, that it was not imagined, it was not only just an appearance, it, like, like he just looked like a man, but he really wasn't. What John is going to say and what every Christian writer says in the New Testament is that God took on a body. Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the second member of the Trinity, the Son, and we say second not in order of importance, they're all equally important. The, the second member of the Trinity, the Son, who existed before he was born, came to earth in a real body. In other words, the Son has something that none of the other two members of the Trinity have. He has a body, physical human body. And that's what John is proclaiming, especially here in the first four verses. He came to earth. No system of teaching, John declares, that denies either the eternal divine pre-existence of Jesus or the historical, we use the word incarnation. What does that mean, incarnation? What does it mean? 
physical appearance of taking on a body, basically. Okay? Taking on a body. The incarnation, God becoming flesh, God becoming a man. That, that those who deny that, you're, you're not a Christian, according to John. You're, you're something else. You can say you're a Christian, but if, if, if you don't have that in your theological uh, portfolio, John's saying you're not genuine. That's, imp- that's a non-negotiable. That's a theological test. Now, there's others too, but that's the main one here in 1 John. The second test is moral. In other words, is the fact that Jesus came to earth, died for your sins, and is your Savior, and you've received that, are you doing what Jesus said to do, which is, if you love me, keep my commandments? Jesus said it pretty simply. John says it very simply. He says it rudely almost. How dare you, John, say that? that but that's what he says. He says things like, look, if, if, you, if you don't love, <laughs> how can you say you love God if you, don't love, if you don't love your brother and sister in Christ? You're false. You're phony. You're, you're not genuine. How can you say you love God who you can't see and you don't love the people around you that you can't That He puts things in black and white terms like that. He's very uncomfortable. But he says there is a moral test. In other words, are we practicing obedience to the God we say we love, to the Jesus that we say we love? What does our life look like? Now, he's not talking about perfection, but what he is talking about throughout the book, because he talks about confessing sin and things like that, all right? But he's saying, is there any evidence that way? And then the third test, the third test is, is social. And, and this... Again, it kind of plays out the second, but this means, is there any love in your life? That, because that theme, he circles back to that time after time after time after time. And Jesus himself said, a new commandment I give you, love one another uh, as I have loved you, right? By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you what? If you put a bumper sticker on your car <laughs> and you're polite enough not to flip somebody off while your bumper sticker's on your car. All right? Then you know you're a believer. Some of you should not have a bumper sticker on your car. All right? So, but, but no, it's not, it's not on any of that external stuff, although some of that stuff is cool and it's nice and, and it, it, it's good to get the message out. But what John is going to come back time and time and time again is, is there any love in your life for your fellow believers? If there's not, you're probably not genuine. Now, these three tests belong to each other. They belong together because faith, love, and holiness are all works of the Holy Spirit. He gives them to us. Therefore, and please hear this, these should not be seen as things with, as currency with which you buy salvation. Okay? In other words, you say to God, okay, I believe the right things. I'm actually doing the right things. And uh, clearly I love people. Therefore, you've got to save me. Right? I got enough currency so I can buy it. That's not how this should be understood. The way it should be understood is that you have true belief. You have in your life a desire, like Paul describes in Romans chapter 7, even though you don't fully pull it off all the time, in the deepest part of your being now, you're a new creature in Christ. You want to do what God says. There's a deep desire to do that. And, and you're practicing love for your, for your fellow Christian. If that's there, in a sense, that's, that's a mark that you're genuine. It's not a way to buy it. It is simply evidence that you have it. Does, does, do you understand the, the distinction, the difference between those two things? This is not a works-based salvation that we go to God and say, here's my money, save me. You go to God and you say, thank you <laughs> for saving me. Now I want my life to reflect it. That's the emphasis. All right, so what, what are we going to talk about today? John boldly claims that in Christ, the eternal God came to earth in a very physical way. That he and the other disciples witnessed that this event makes eternal life possible. So John's going to make the following points in his introduction to the letter. Here's the first point. 
The incarnation, what did that mean again? Incarnation? God taking a body, all right? The incarnation is a fact. It's a fact. I got quite a bit to say on this and, we, and, and not enough time to say it, so we're going to rush through this. But here's the first verse. That, it's, it's strange to start a letter with the word that, but John does. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That which was from the beginning. Now that's a, that's a key word. It means, it means that Jesus was around when, a, when the beginning happened. Now, what does this remind you of? Other, other, any other writing in the Bible? Genesis. He wants you to go back there. What else? What other? John chapter 1. Same writer. In the beginning, in other words, when the beginning happened, was the Word. The Word was already there. The Word didn't pop up in creation. God did not create Jesus, all right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So you see the same theme right here in his, in his letter. That which was from the beginning, pre-incarnate existence of Christ. By pre-incarnate existence, what we mean is that before Jesus got a body, he existed. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's several passages where we believe the pre-incarnate Christ shows up. One of them is was uh, the, 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 the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, one like the Son of the God. Okay, there, there are several appearances, we believe, of the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. In the beginning, he was there. The point here is that he existed before he was born. Jesus freaked the, the Pharisees out one day because they were talking about Abraham being their father, and he said, before Abraham was, past tense, I am present tense from beginning to end tense. By the way, what is I am in Hebrew? Yahweh. The personal name that God gave himself. When Jesus said this, when he said I am, and you'd have to, okay, and, uh, Yahweh, it, they, that, they wanted to kill him right then because to a good Jewish person, you don't say you're God. Frankly, to any sane person, you don't say you're God, do you? I mean, if you say, start saying you're God... <laughs> There's a problem. That's why, and it's so clear, that's why an awful lot of people who study the Bible and yet don't believe want to take those kind of phrases out of Jesus' mouth because they understand fully what they mean if he said them. C.S. Lewis put it this way, either he was Lord or he was a liar or he was crazy. You can't, you know, if he actually said this stuff, you can't patronize him by saying, I believe in Jesus as a great teacher, great man, great moral leader. Lewis's point is that anyone who says this stuff about themselves has got to be off their rocker or got to be the worst kind of, the worst kind of deceiver in the world. You can't, you can't patronize a statement like that, can you? If I said, I'm God, there's, there's only a few things really to do with me. And, and, and one may not be to keep listening as if I'm making sense. Okay? So that's what John is claiming and he claims that because there are many in his day, and, and it goes on to our day, who frankly simply would not believe that. Um, he, goes, he goes, and we're going to deal with that in just a little bit, but he goes on to say the following. He says, just in case you misunderstood that, he says, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard. In other words, John says, we, me, Peter, the rest of the gang, we heard him. We heard him. Which we have seen with our eyes, we saw him. All of us, we had eyes, we could all see with him, <laughs> with them. God gave us eyes. We saw him with our eyes. Which we looked upon. Now that, wouldn't you, why did he need to say which we looked upon after he said we've seen him with our eyes? Wouldn't that presuppose that they looked upon him? It's a different word. And, it, and it's a word, in, in the Gospel of John, you have this great scene after the resurrection in John chapter 20. You have Peter and John running the tomb. The women said, hey, he's not there. He's, he said he's so they run to the tomb of Jesus. And John, normally humble, says he got there first before Peter. But then, but then I was faster than Peter, basically, is what he's saying. So I got there first. 
John says, and I stood outside, but then Peter comes barreling in past him, and he goes into the tomb, and Peter sees that it's empty. But then John goes in, and he says this, and the other disciples saw and believed. In other words, at that point, when John saw the shroud or the grave clothes that were there, they were still there, but Jesus' body wasn't, it said he he saw, but now he believed. He understood to the point of belief. It made a difference. He wasn't just seeing things out there, unable to put the, the pieces together. He said, oh, this is what he was talking about all this time when he said he was going to suffer and die and then rise again. This is it. So he saw and he understood. That's what we beheld. We, we beheld him means. We looked upon him. John is saying, not only we see him with our eyes, but we saw him, we understood we understood who this guy is. And then he says, that which we, which, what we have touched, in case you're wondering, with our hands, concerning the word of life. This word touched, it, it's more than just, you know, poking, <laughs> okay? It is, it, it, it comes last in this, in this series here. So uh, John wants you to think, okay, that's, that's the climax of this whole thing. We touched him. Um, it, it's not just, you know, a cursory thing. It's, it's, it's to handle, to touch, uh, to examine closely. And what, is, what does your mind go to now in terms of encounters disciples had with Jesus? John chapter 20 again, a guy named Thomas. Right? Thomas wasn't there the first time Jesus appeared to disciples after the resurrection. Thomas... I like Thomas. Everybody makes fun of Thomas. They say, I, Thomas is a, is a realist. I like him. Thomas told the other disciples, look, guys, I don't care what you saw. <laughs> I'm not going to believe it until I put my hand in the side where we know the spear went in, until I touch the wounds. And until that happens, I'm not believing it because you guys are frankly mystics and I'm not. I want real hard, solid evidence. That's Thomas. And then the very next week, a few days later, Jesus pops in on him, as he did after the resurrection. Hey, guys. And Thomas was there. And Thomas is looking. And then what does Jesus say? It's almost like Jesus, had, Jesus was reading his mail, right? He knew what Thomas had said before. And he said, Thomas, come here. Check it out. Touch me. Feel here. The wound. Okay. When, when you touch someone, that is, that there's a real body there, right? And so that's what John, he, he goes out of his way to make sure that nobody can misunderstand this. The Son of God took on a real body, and even after his resurrection, you could touch it. He ate fish, right? It was, it's real in the sense that we understand real. You could see it, you could touch it, you could hear all of the senses that God gave us were engaged in this. And so John goes to great lengths. Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you see? Blessed are those who believe even though they, they can't see. Now, in the, why does he go to such great lengths? You know, I'm all freaked out now because I don't know how much time I have left with this new setting. All right, so it's 10.54. We start at 10. All right, we're going to go about another five minutes. I, I will wrap this up. Here we go. All right. In the late first century, there was a, a view which later became known as Gnosticism. And it's still with us today. Gnosticism was the belief that the, that the physical realm is like a jail. And our souls are imprisoned in these physical bodies. And the whole goal is to get our soul out of these bodies so it can experience God to the fullest. These bodies are a hindrance. And so there was a teaching very early in the church, and it started obviously with John, but it came to full force in the second century. In other words, the years between 100 and 200, where we have the, the quote, Gnostic Gospels were written then, not by the original apostles. And so the idea that God would take on a body was frankly offensive. It was offensive to the whole Greek world. That's why when Paul talks about Jesus, he says, you know, we preach Christ crucified uh, to, to the Greeks, or in other words, everybody who's not Jewish, that's just, just plain foolishness. Why would a God die? And to the Jewish people, well, that's offensive because the Son of God can't die, especially on a cross. That's a, that's a thing of curse. 
And so the whole, the whole message of God taking on a real body was offensive and unbelievable. Thank you, God, for giving us a message so easy for people to grasp, right? But that's what happened, and it was necessary, as we're, gonna, as we're going to see. And so John goes out of his way. He's, he, he needs to counter what later became full-on Gnosticism. There was another thing called docetism, which basically was the same way that Jesus only appeared to be a man. We know that he was really God, but he appeared to be a man, but he wasn't, in fact. Uh, there were all kinds of others that church history in the early church they had to deal with. I'm just going to list them because the names are fun to say. Apollinarianism, all right, Nestorianism, Eutychianism, uh, Ebionism, uh, uh, Arianism. And they are all alive today in one way or another. They are all subpar understandings of who Jesus was, either denying his, that he was God or denying that he was human. One way, they, they fall one way or the other. There's, there's variations of it, but that's how they go. What John is saying is that he is God, and he is also man, fully human. This body he had could be heard, seen, touched, I assume even smelled when the road got hot. All right? That's, that was Jesus. He had a real, he was really a man. And John goes to great lengths for them to understand that. Now, how is this stuff around today? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was a godlike being, but not really the Son of God in the flesh. That just can't happen. Mormonism has a really complicated belief about Jesus, does not believe that Jesus is eternal. In fact, they really don't even believe God the Father is eternal in that sense, that God the Father created Jesus, and he's the offspring of God the Father. He was the, like the first spirit child. He was born of Mary, and he was born of Mary and God the Father, not the Holy Spirit. And, and he was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. And there's no trinity in Mormonism. In Judaism, Jesus is the most influential of those who falsely claim to be Messiah. Therefore, he's the most dangerous. Um, Islam, Jesus is a prophet. So all of those kind of fall into the category, of, we'll believe he's a man, but there's no way he was God or the, or, as, as we would understand it. So those are all around, all around us today. Views about Jesus that don't quite get it right in terms of who he was. And Jesus was concerned that people knew who he was. How do we know he was concerned? Well, because he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Right? At, at, at Caesarea Philippi. Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're the prophet like Moses. Some say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead, even though they didn't really believe in that. But they couldn't deny that Jesus was doing some special things. They're weird things, miracle-type things. But, man, they, they, people saw him do these things and still would not believe that he was God incarnate come to earth. The disciples had a hard time with it. And they saw it all. The New Testament clearly teaches both the humanity and the deity of Jesus. And that is what John is trying to do in these first four verses is to convince you, to show you that this guy who was from the beginning, who, who always existed, came here. In a body. It's miraculous. It is amazing. It's astounding. And we take it for granted. John didn't. And he's encouraging us not to take it for granted. The second point John wants to make. The eyewitness testimony is reliable. He says this. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you. Don't want to unpack this whole thing. Two words here are key. First of all is the word we testify. So he's saying, we heard this, we saw it, we did it, blah, 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 and this was life and all of that, and he says all that stuff about life, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But he uses two words. We witnessed it. We are witnesses. We testify. That's what a witness does. So John is saying, we're on the witness stand. Somebody is asking us, what did you see? Here's what we saw. We saw a guy. And we saw him do some miraculous things. We heard what he said when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never, will, will never die. We saw at least afterwards, him alive. 
you know what? We chickened out, except John was the only guy who didn't. We chickened out. We weren't there at the cross. John was. But we saw him afterwards. And, and we touched him. This, he's real. He was as real, perhaps more real, than he was before he died. You go explain it. We can't. All we know is that it happened. We saw it. We testify. To, to testify, you have to have personal experience. So what John is saying to his readers, look, guys, there's, there's some authority going on here. I'm not, I'm not just a man on the street, okay? God in his providence allowed me to experience some things that you guys didn't get to experience, but that doesn't make me better than you, but what it does make me is able to tell you about it. And so I'm testifying to it. I saw this stuff. And I want, you to, I want you to understand it like I do because it's the most amazing thing that I've ever seen in my life. So I test, we testify. And again, he doesn't just say I. He uses first person. We. All these other apostles, the disciples minus Judas, who were there. And then the second word he uses is we proclaim. We have a commission. What did Jesus tell them to do before he ascended to heaven? Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do what? Obey everything I've told you to do. We have a commission. We proclaim to you what we saw, and we have to do this because, frankly, we were commanded to. And if you had been there and seen the stuff we did, you, frankly, wouldn't be able to help proclaiming it. Yeah, we know a lot of people think we are absolutely out of our minds, but we don't care because we know it's real. We saw it. We proclaim. There's an authority in the proclamation we have. We're, we are reliable. We're not, we're not guys going around. We didn't want to believe it. <laughs> we came to belief in the resurrection against our wills. The evidence was indisputable. We know people just don't get up off the grave. We know that. But he did. And we saw it. So we testify and we proclaim. Thirdly, the message about Christ is of utmost importance. It is, without a doubt, the most important message that the world has ever heard. It's the most important thing about you and me. F frankly, if it's not, it's, it's worth, if it's not true... If it's not true, it's worth nothing. We shouldn't be bothering with it if it's not true. It's, we don't, we're not here in church for religion, religion for religion's sake. I, you know, God bless the people who meet in church every Sunday and don't believe everything or anything. We had a memorial service yesterday at a certain church, and, and you know some things were said there. I go, why, why do you bother? You don't really believe any of this stuff. Why do you bother? Well, I think the reason is people want to feel religious. They want to feel like they're making some kind of connection with God, but they want to do it on their own terms. And what John is saying is you can't do it on your own terms. You've got to do it on the terms of the person who came and who died for you and who said this is how it is. But we don't like his terms because his terms say that we have to repent, that there is, that there is, um, that there is a, a, um, a humility to this that we, we would rather do without. We'd rather earn it than say we have to receive it like a gift. So John said this message is concerning the word of life. Now, if you've heard me preach long enough, you know that in Greek they had several ways to say the word life. We have one. Okay, they had the word suke, P-S-E-U-C-H-E. -E. It is soulish life. It, and whenever the New Testament writers use life in this sense, like Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul, his suke, his life, his physical life that is also immaterial, but it's a life that your parents pass along to you because they have it. So you are passed along by your parents a life that is both physical and soulish, right? You, we know we have an immaterial part of us. Everybody knows that. You have to be educated out of that to believe that you don't have a soul, <laughs> right? You have a soul, and your soul is eternal. So that's the kind of life our parents give us. And that's the word the New Testament uses. Another life, which is not used much of humans, is the word bios. We get the word biology from it. It's basically life. 
It's life as we know it, right? Physical life around us, okay? The animal life, all of the stuff around us, plant life. The third word is Zoe. Third word is Zoe, and that's always the word that John uses here. And, it's, and, and usually before the word Zoe comes the word Ionos, which is the word eternal. And so he's saying, it, not here, but he's saying concerning the word of life, Zoe. And the reason they use that word, the reason New Testament writers use that is because what they were trying to show you is that this life, this Zoe kind of life, is a life that God possesses that we don't. When you're born, you don't have it. You have soulish life. You have suke life. You don't have Zoe life. By the way, Zoe life is the only life that inherits eternal life. If you don't have it, you don't have eternal life. If you don't have the Son, John later says in this, you don't have eternal life. You don't have the life that God gives. He hasn't given. You have to receive that life from Him. You can't get it on your own. That life comes by way of a gift made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you don't have Zoe, you don't have the kind of life we're talking about here. And they use that word very purposefully throughout the New Testament. He says this life, Zoe, was made manifest. In other words, we've seen it. And we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life. There's the word eternal. The eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So John and the other apostles were witnesses to and had a commission to proclaim eternal life. Now, folks, that's good news because we don't have it. The human condition is broken. We die. I, again, I was at a memorial service yesterday, and one of the things that the pastor, God bless her, said, although she was dead wrong about this, is that God did not make life to last forever. Wait a minute. We die not because God broke us. We die because we broke ourselves through sin. And Paul is very clear. When sin entered the world, death entered the world. God did not intend for that to be our lot, but it now is. He will one day restore life to us. That was his intent from the beginning. In fact, we have it right now if you have received the free gift of eternal life through Christ and you have the Holy Spirit. You will search your whole life. People are searching their whole life for that. It's the missing piece to every human being, and everybody's striving to find it. And you have a lot of nonsense written like, well, just the quest is important. Well, if, you're not, if you don't believe there's anything to find, why go look for it? What the New Testament writers are saying is that it's here. You, you can stop looking. No, I need to keep looking. It's, it's, it's noble. It's gallant. The quest. He's the answer. You've arrived. No, I can't arrive. What will I do if I arrive? You see how silly this gets? This is the message. It's of utmost, it, it is the thing. It, it's the sense that you might have. C.S. Lewis called it joy, and we're going to look at that in a second. It's that, it's that longing that every human being, I believe, is born with, and it comes on you in waves sometimes, and it comes on you in, 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 in waves of glory, and then it disappears, and you wonder, what was that? I want that again. And you keep trying to search that, and in a sense, Jesus is saying, follow me, and that's it. It's of utmost importance. If it isn't, it's worth nothing. Life. We're talking about life. The thing we all want. Fourthly and lastly, the intent of the letter is to nurture fellowship and joy. Now, this almost seems anticlimactic to me, but this is how John ends it. It's not anticlimactic to him, so there must be something wrong with me. He writes this, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have, and it's strange here, he doesn't say that you may have salvation. He's kind of already said that. He said, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. It was important to say it because of all the subpar views of Jesus going around. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I, John is saying, we want you to join in. We apostles, me, Peter, James, John, you know, uh, Philip, Bartholomew, all, all the rest of the gang. <laughs> Thomas, the stick in the mud, even him. Philip, the guy not so sharp. All right, Bartholomew, you know, the guy that's idealist. Oh, these guys, Matthew, the tax collector. 
we want you to come into this fellowship that we had. Man, when we were hanging around Jesus, it was the best days of our lives. And we, it was the weirdest days of our lives. But we want you to join in that. It, it's amazing. We are, we are all, and when you look at the disciples, you say, man, they came from every walk of life and from every, so there was a zealot in there named Simon who wanted to kill all Romans, right? He, was, he, wanted, he wanted liberation through military action. We wanted to just kill these Romans. He was a disciple. Somehow, Jesus brought all these guys together into this unbelievable community of love for one another. That can only happen as we put down our own agendas and take on the agenda of Jesus. And John is saying, I want, we want you to join in this. This fellowship is unbelievable. And I mean that not in the overuse of the word unbelievable that we always use. I will say awesome, but not in the way that we always use awesome in, in a weird way. Fellowship is another word we use all the time. This is a whole lot more than having a barbecue after church as nice as it is and having, and having cookies and coffee and orange juice and stuff before church and small talk. That's all great, but that is all made better because of what's real with fellowship. That's not it itself. It's a manifestation of it, but only one. So John is saying, we want you in this with us. And by the way, we want our joy to be complete. Now, there, there's some question whether the word is our or your in there because of, of the, the, some textual evidence, but either way, our or your, what John is saying here is that joy... Joy, distinguished from simple happiness, distinguished from giddiness, distinguished from everything's going great, I'm loving life. Joy is that deep-seated assurance. It's almost like the Hebrew word shalom, the, the sense of well-being that you know for sure because Jesus is real, he died for my sins, I have eternal life, and the world can't kill, they can kill me, but they can't kill me. That was very real for these guys and for many Christians around the face of the earth. There is a joy. It's almost like we're in on an inside joke that nobody gets. And we get to talk to each other about this inside joke. You know what? Yeah, these guys, are, yeah, they're about ready to chop our heads off. They think they're killing us. They're not. You can't lose. And, and so it's that sense of joy. And what John is saying is that that sense of joy is made complete when we're sharing it together. It is exactly what Jesus said to them. And I'm, again, I know John went back to that upper room the night before Jesus was crucified where he said, look, guys, I'm telling you these things so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. This is the night before he died and things were heavy in the room. Peter just said, I'm not going to deny you. Jesus just said to him, yeah, you're going to not only deny me once, three times, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going you're gonna to disown me three times. It was after that. Jesus said, I'm telling you these things so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. This, this is the best thing ever. If you don't think this is the best thing ever, you haven't perceived it. If this is just an afterthought in your life, you haven't fully understood what the gospel is. You haven't, you haven't plumbed the depths of it yet. If you're fooling around with other things that you think are bringing thrills, C.S. Lewis put it this way, we, we fool around with sex and drink and drugs and everything else that we think is going to bring us joy when eternal joy is put right out in front of us. He says we're far too easily pleased. We have in us the Holy Spirit, the very being of God. Christ in you, Paul says, the hope of glory. If that is not seen by you as the greatest thing ever, ponder it. <laughs> I, I don't have words. I wish I did. Think on it. Next step, as the band comes up, we're going to do some more worshiping. If you are here today and you've never made this step, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking to you if you've been in church and, 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 and you think everything is okay, but right now the Holy Spirit's kind of pounding you a little bit, kind of telling you, you know what, you haven't stepped over the line. 
You have not stepped over the line from lack of belief to belief. You haven't stepped over the line to truly be a follower of Jesus. You're still holding back something. You think this thing's better over here than the gospel. And he's pounding you right now. I, I'm talking to you. And what I want to say is that you need to believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. Maybe you, you haven't quite swallowed that yet. I don't know. Believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. And then prove your belief by living a life in harmony and love with him and his people. That's simply it. If you haven't stepped over that line of belief yet, I invite you to do it this morning. I invite you after we're done worshiping today, and you know who you are if the Holy Spirit's pounding on you because your heart's beating real fast right now and you're, and you're, you're sweating and it's not just because it's hot in here. So those of you fanning yourselves, no, I don't think that God's necessarily talking to you. He might be, but, but he might not be. But you know what I'm talking about. If that's going on in your life right now, please talk to me afterwards. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for life. Help us to enjoy it, to, to, to have our joy be full and our fellowship with one another be deep. We pray these things, Jesus. Thank you that you came to earth, that you really lived, and you, and you showed yourself to men and women who were around when you were here. And that message has gone forth to where 2,000 years later we're recipients of it and we have believed it without seeing you physically. Thank you for giving us the faith to do that. In Jesus' name.